Yeah, um, visiting from Dunedin, an early start to, to get here this morning. Um, I, it's a real pleasure to talk about 100 years of insulin, and I guess I have a small connection to 1922 that year. Both my maternal grandparents were born in 1922, and my grandmother went on to work at the Banting Institute briefly in Toronto. So have a little connection there, a couple of, couple of degrees of separation from Frederick Banting, but sort of an early connection with my family and diabetes and insulin. But I guess as I talk uh, today, I hope uh, I can uh, bring you all to the realization that while we wait for a cure, that really advanced technology is the gold standard of uh, diabetes management, and it's really where those who want it should be um, able to get it. So I'll, I'll talk through that uh, briefly with you all today. Uh, I, I do have some disclosures. I've received funding. You know, there's no way to do the sort of research I do without uh, support, particularly in the way of the technology from all the industry partners who make it. So just so you take that into context as I talk. All of you, um, you know, don't need to see these photos. You know all about diabetes probably, but just to remind you what diabetes was before the discovery of insulin as we're, as we're celebrating that achievement. And, and this is uh, the, the young children uh, prior to receiving those first injections and, and what it was like and, of course, uh, was universally fatal before uh, insulin became available. And this is Leonard Thompson. He's the first child and the first person to receive insulin. Uh, and of course, that was a great celebration. People often talked about resurrection type experiences, people coming back from the dead. But you can see there already in, the, in his early 20s, he's got a cane in this photo. And of course, he died at 27, tragically, from complications related to diabetes. So, you know, there was those initial celebrations, but clearly there's a lot of tragedy underlying that. And we were a long way away from where we would like to be. And I guess, where are we today? Uh, again, I'd like to say that with our traditional therapies, we're still a long, long way from where we would like to be as well. And, and we need to be pushing harder for advanced technologies that are here and available right now. So as an example of this, this is a, a young lady from uh, my previous clinic. So she's transitioned to my adult colleagues. But you can see she's had diabetes for 15 years. She's on injection therapy. She's got severe needle phobia experiencing a lot of burden over those 15 years with her diabetes. She's had extremely unhealthy diabetes for the last five years at least. Uh, we would, these numbers here, uh, 120, we have a target to prevent complications of being under 53. So she's uh, miles away from where we would like her to be uh, to look after her and prevent long-term health issues for her. And you can see this note from her endocrinologist at the Diabetes Centre. Uh, unfortunately, I felt rather powerless talking to her. So again, for five years, nobody's been able to shift her trajectory and her health remains extremely fraught and her risk of early death is uh, very high. So, so we always ask ourselves where to from here. And I guess just to make this point a little higher, Here's some data from Australia there on uh, my left uh, and um, from America on the right. And just those red lines running through those graphs are where uh, our targets are and the levels where we know if you sit below those, uh, you have much lower risk of experiencing complications and early death from diabetes. And you can see there right across the lifespan in both those data sets, we're miles away from those lines and our mean levels from our clinics. And you can see there particularly though, uh, in adolescence and early adulthood, we, we sit far, far away from those lines. So we've got, with our traditional therapy, we're no way near coming to the sort of uh, treatments we would like to see. And if you look at the percent actually reaching target in Australia and New Zealand, you can see 18% only of children in New Zealand reach the targets we consider to be healthy and only 10% of those who are 14 to 25. So again, the currently funded traditional therapies are not doing what we would like them to do. Just to really hammer that message home, here's Scottish data, and really it just shows uh, both men and women lose between 11 and 13 years of their lives if you're diagnosed before the age of 20. So you can see at the bottom there, 76% of men, 83% of women survive to 70 in the starter set. Uh, compared to 47% of uh, men and 55% of women with type 1 diabetes. 
If you look at the Swedish data, if you're diagnosed before the age of 10, you lose even more years, so 14 to almost 18 years of your life lost. So diabetes is a serious illness, it's not nothing, it's not just burden, people are losing years and years of their lives related to diabetes and traditional therapies, again, are far from where we want them to be. Uh, automation, this is a nice way just to explain it. Lots of people are interested in automated cars, so again, it's just the same for diabetes. What you need is you need an engine, you need something to deliver the insulin, or in a car, the engine to push you along. Uh, you need sensors, so in a car, you have cameras all the way around the car, it can tell where it is in the environment, and it can help uh, a computer in the car to make decisions about the direction you should go. So automated insulin delivery is the same. You need a sensor, you need an engine, uh, and you need a clever computer that can take all that data and make plans uh, for where you should head. And this is uh, what it looks like on a person. You have a continuous glucose sensor. It sends the glucose level round to the insulin pump. The insulin pump has a clever brain inside it, clever computer that takes that data, and it makes decisions and gives a certain variable amount of insulin. In New Zealand, we have uh, three main options available to us. All of them are great, so the, um, we're very pleased with the options that have been made available to us. Uh, you note here, um, the pumps themselves are funded for some uh, in all cases here, uh, but the glucose sensors are not funded at all, and this is leading to major inequity. And of course, these were available since 2017 in Australia and all the other countries we compare ourselves to. Uh, and if you look here, these are all the major international guidelines, and all of those now say that the gold standard method for measuring glucose is with continuous glucose monitoring, not finger prick testing. You know, finger prick testing really is the urine testing uh, of our modern age. And here's how uh, an automated system works. I, I'm showing you here that a Medtronic system, so I apologise for showing a particular brand, but these are just nice slides. But you can see here, we set a target, which is that nice green line running through the middle. And you can see, depending on the system, you have a different uh, degree of flexibility with the target, but you set a target. And that's really what we'd consider a healthy glucose. And then you have this pink uh, bits along the bottom there, wiggling up and down. That's the basal insulin, or the insulin that's constantly delivered, and using the glucose data, it wiggles up and down, and it's constantly changing. Every single day is different, and you can see why uh, using simple injection therapy is no way near as refined as allowing a computer to make these decisions. And here you can see at a certain point you have these blue pulses come in, these are the Cs, and, and they are where the computer also makes decisions to give boluses or extra doses of insulin to help things along. So there's a lot of clever decision making that's happening all the time, and it's different every single day uh, and every, every hour uh, through the day. And again, these can be delivered every five minutes on this system, but it depends what system you're using, but that gives you a, a pretty good idea of how an automated insulin delivery system works. We've had a lot of interest in this. We had some of the first experiences in the world with my colleague Martin de Bock in Christchurch. Uh, and of course this study went on to uh, make this system available worldwide. So uh, this got regulatory approval in Europe and that subsequently moved throughout uh, the world wherever you could access this. But we took 30 patients in Dunedin, 30 patients in uh, Christchurch, and we placed them on this system. And again, whatever system you look at, you get data like this. And, and people improve by around 12 and a half percent, or uh, spend three more days, uh, three more hours <laughs> a day in a normal glucose range. Now these are health, these are quite healthy people with diabetes, the ones who are enthusiastic enough to get into these trials, so they're not necessarily representative of all. And you can see a nice trace there of what glucose levels look like on an automated system. Uh, the pink lines there. Uh, showing what the automated system is and the grey lines are showing uh, the next best possible traditional therapy which is also a pump with a sensor uh, that's also um, helping prevent hypoglycemia. So it's a very clever comparator. So these aren't, again, not the same as uh, comparing them to the average person with diabetes. Uh, and again, some other data led by my colleague Martin de Bock, but just showing really the same thing again, uh, just recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but again, a 14% overall improvement in time and range. So that's time in the healthy period uh, over the next best possible traditional therapy with these systems. 
Uh, and again, 60% of people in this study reached target uh, versus 15% of those who were in the control arm. So automated systems get you uh, into a healthy target, no matter what system you use, uh, with much more success than any other system uh, that you could possibly use. And then we've had much more exciting data because, again, we take these healthy people and we put them onto these systems. But what happens if you take people who are not in target or who are struggling or who are really unhealthy or having difficulties with the burden of their diabetes? And here's um, early single arm data from uh, our team uh, from Christchurch in Dunedin uh, run by Alyssa here. But again, showing that they have a drop in their HbA1c of 2.9% using an automated system. So that's a life-changing drop, and unheard of. There's no research really anywhere uh, in diabetes that shows a drop uh, that large uh, over multiple people. And that's the table there uh, with all the lines going down, just showing that every single person in that study improved by over 1% and some by dramatically more. But what uh, that means is you get a 38.7% improvement in time and range for those people, uh, which is quite considerable. So you see an improvement from 27.7% of the time in target to 66.4. But what that really means is they spend 9.3 hours more every single day with a healthy glucose level. So that's a huge uh, impact on their long-term risk of complications. I just bring you back to the real people involved in this. So here's some cases that we've uh, used from our work. So this is Miss Al again, the, the young lady I showed at the start, very unhealthy for a long period of time. And again, she's from quite a uh, deprived background, so a lot of socioeconomic hardship. But after three months, her glucose is completely in target, so gone from 120 uh, down to 48, and now out to a year, she's exactly the same. So uh, these systems are very successful at keeping people uh, healthy, and I'm sure that we've saved the health system considerable amounts. If we can sustain her there, then her risk of complications and early death will dramatically fall. And of course, she loves the system. And this is sort of what her data looks like. Uh, she reaches target for her time and range. She spends 75% of the time with a healthy glucose. And again, before the study, she would have spent maybe 10% uh, with a healthy glucose. Uh, with that last slide, just showing how powerful these systems particularly are while you sleep or while, you, while you're um, uh, you know, at night. And basically your glucose, uh, you tell people you don't need to worry about your glucose anymore. You don't need to worry about your safety. The system will take you to a normal glucose level and sit you there all night. Uh, this is her data, again, just showing what a day looks like for her. So there's still ups and downs. These systems are far from perfect still, but they're going to continually improve. But compared to traditional therapy, they're miles ahead uh, of where uh, we are. Of course, there are people with traditional therapy who can get very healthy diabetes, but again, we're taking people here who have um, the least healthy diabetes and proving that we can get them where we want them. Just showing that beautiful control overnight so she wakes up with a healthy, normal glucose every night. And again, that has big impacts on how your day starts and how you sleep. Uh, I'll take a, a even more challenging young person, but someone we've learned a lot from and really enjoyed working with. He's 22, also been in my clinic in the past, but his HbA1c is about as unhealthy as you possibly get. The only way to measure his um, diabetes health is with a laboratory because our systems we use in the hospital uh, can't read how unhealthy his diabetes is. So for over five years, he's had an HbA1c uh, that's over three times less healthy than the target glucose levels that we should have. He has frequent hospitalizations due to the unhealth of his diabetes, uh, and he's clearly at extremely high risk of early death and complications. This is his traces um, after starting our trial and after starting automated insulin delivery. So again, not perfectly healthy, but you can see on two days there, 56% of his time now in the healthy range. He was 0% before starting the study. And on the second day there, he's 76% time in the healthy range. So just completely life-changing for him. Uh, and he... Uh, was a gamble for us, but he, he's loved the system, he continually wears it, he's had no problems, no hospitalizations. And so, again, we haven't cured all the ills of uh, young adulthood, he still gets up to mischief, he's had some unrelated intoxication admissions, but he's had nothing, nothing related to diabetes during the course of our, of our study.
So completely trouble free. And after six months, his HbA1c had gone from 169 to 55. Again, unheard of. I think he's probably has the maybe the world record for uh, the healthiest one of these systems has ever made somebody. Uh, he's put on a lot of weight. Uh, and clearly, I think the system saved his life. And the key is going to be how we keep giving him the sensors, the continuous glucose monitoring sensors, uh, to keep him in this position. I think if, they, if he was to lose access to the sensors, we can fund him the pump. But without the sensors, I don't think um, he has many more years of life uh, left. And he loves the system. So these are just some quotes, and I always find these quite powerful from, from the same study. And we've got a much bigger trial starting with a more advanced system uh, in maybe January, February next year. And so we'll be looking for participants from all around New Zealand, so uh, from uh, nationwide. So um, we'll look forward to that. So they'll be age 7 to 25, and they need to be uh, with diabetes that's out of target, so unhealthy young people, and we're really wanting to really hammer home this point that those who have the greatest need will do the best with this technology. We'd really like to get it into their hands as well as uh, those, uh, well, everybody I think has a need for this technology, but they have the greatest need. But you can see here a lovely quote from uh, one of our Christchurch participants. Uh, Pump's been truly life-changing. He struggled to focus at school, uh, and he's now achieving uh, the top student. Uh, my favourite moment from the trial was when she casually remarked to me one day, I forgot I had diabetes today. Uh, and then you can see these other ones, people worried about safety of their children overnight. And the, these systems really provide a lot of um, reassurance uh, at those times. Um, this is really just a, a quick note on equity. This is pump data in New Zealand. So pumps are partially funded in New Zealand. Uh, but this data could be mirrored through to continuous glucose monitoring. And it just hammers home, you can see here with the box around it, uh, New Zealand Europeans are three times more likely to get an insulin pump in New Zealand than people who are Pacific. They're two times more likely in New Zealand to get an insulin pump than people who are Māori. Uh, and that's with funded access. So there is massive inequity. And if you look at continuous glucose monitoring, where people have to self-fund that technology currently, there'll be massive inequity. This will be even more exaggerated. And if you look at it here by socioeconomic status, we see exactly the same thing. Uh, Q1 at the top there are the least deprived people in New Zealand. And again, uh, they have almost three times more access to insulin pump therapy than those who are in the Q5, the most deprived uh, quintiles in New Zealand. So again, equity is going to be our biggest challenge moving forward unless we can get true equitable access and true funded access to this technology. So CGM and pump access is the major equity issue in Pharmac, in my opinion, needs to urgently correct that, particularly because it's impacting equity so much. So my overall conclusions is, is diabetes is a lifelong and devastating uh, disease, and traditional therapies right now in New Zealand result in many years uh, life lost. And there's considerably better therapy available, but it's unfunded. Uh, automated insulin delivery is the gold standard for type 1 treatment, and we see large improvements in glucose. It definitely improves quality of life and burden, uh, and it's safe. And I think it's particularly strong for those who are less healthy, but really it fits everybody uh, who wishes to have it uh, quite well. And I think equity of, issue is the, uh, equity of access is our big issue now, not, not necessarily whether these systems work well or not. We'll continue to refine them and improve them and get better access, but we need funded continuous glucose monitoring and improved pump access uh, now. And I'll just uh, thank... Uh, my team and collaborators and the data I've presented here, but, but we um, have the great pleasure to have people we work with right across New Zealand in these studies, so uh, without them we couldn't do any of that. So thank you very much.